It is a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Joseph Grant Kepper, who is a dentist and an attorney, DDS, JD, ABLM. What's the ABLM stand for? The DABLM is a Diplomat American Board of Legal Medicine. Wow, that is so amazing. I'm so honored to have you on the show. Dr. Grass Kepper currently practices full time in Bellport, New York and is an associate clinical professor at Stony Brook School of Dental Medicine, teaching professionalism, ethics, and risk management. He was the past director of professional responsibility courses and past editor-in-chief of the Stony Brook School of Dental Medicine GPR Literature Review Journal. He has been awarded six fellowships, that is so amazing, Academy of General Dentistry, American Endodontic Society, International Congress of Oral Implantologists, American Society of Aussie Integration, American College of Legal Medicine, and American College of Dentists. He is also a diplomat in the American Board of Legal Medicine and has a law degree. He is a board member of the International Dental Ethics and Law Society, American College of Legal Medicine, and the Suffolk County Dental Society. He also provides practice management consulting and expert witness testimony. He belongs to many professional organizations and has served as a consultant to several state dental boards. Dr. Grasskepper has authored many peer-reviewed articles, lectured and published nationally and internationally, and recently published a book, Professional Responsibility in Dentistry, a guide to law and ethics. So is that on um, Amazon? Yes, what, it is. What's the best way to get that book? Uh, go right to Amazon and type my name in and it should come right up. So, it's, so uh, type in Joseph P. Grass. Or just, no, just Kemper. Yeah, that'd work. Or just Joseph Grass Kemper. But yeah. It's gr- but it's not the green grass. It's just grass with one S. G-R-A-S oh, yeah. Kemper. Yeah. Right. So, so how did so tell us about your journey? How did you decide to become a dentist and an attorney? What, what, how did that happen? Well, I originally back in the seventies when I got out of college, I wanted to go to med school, but that doesn't didn't happen. So I applied to dental school, went to Ohio State, and then the Navy paid my way through dental school on a Navy scholarship, which ended up taking me to San Diego, where I was for twenty years, and there I uh, started. Well bought a practice and then turned it into one of the first multi-specialty practices I know of. Um, and then it was all fee for service, no insurance back then. And then in 96, we decided to move close to my wife's family here on Long Island. And hence, uh, here we are. I went to law school because uh, my dad always wanted to go to law school, never did. And it kind of offered me say, hey, you know, go ahead. You know, it's four years and what are you gonna be? Four years older if you don't do it. So I went. So, so walk us through the decision of uh, staying in San Diego and just getting a divorce and being single versus keeping your marriage together and leaving beautiful San Diego to go to cold winters in northern New York. How did that well, happen? She must be bad. an amazing lady. Yeah, yeah. I have a great wife. That's all I can tell you. Um, well, I, I, that, you, you need, that would have happened. You need no more proof that your wife is amazing if she could drag you from San Diego to, uh, to New York winters. No, it's not bad in Long Island. I grew up in Cleveland, so it's, it's like Buffalo, you know, that's that snow belt. So here is not that bad. So I enjoy the change of seasons. So I want to start first with um, when you and I got out of school, it was basically fee for service or indemnity insurance. You would just submit your fee to Delta, and their only question was the, what percent they're going to pay. They paid 100% for cleanings and exercise. And then, and then through my 30 years of practice, along the road, they said, you know what? We don't care what your fees are. We're going to send you the fees, thus a PPO, which right. worked out to be about a 40% reduction in fees. Right. And, and so how do you think that's changed the profession of dentistry, going from indemnity fee for service to PPO? I think it's changed quite a bit. Uh, what it's done is uh, two things. One positive thing is that uh, it allowed more people to have dental coverage and it allowed more people to have dental care. That's the upside. But the downside is, is that unless you have your business model properly set and your techniques down to a honed skill, you, it's very hard to make a living on just PPO patients. Uh, you really have to um, have a mixture of patients and it's changing it in the way that, uh, you know, you have to learn to negotiate with the insurance companies. It's a whole new business of dentistry, as you know. Uh, you have to learn how to talk to these insurance companies and get coverage. You have to be an advocate if you're going to take PPO for your patient. Just as like an attorney is an advocate for his his client, you have to become more of an advocate of of your patient for getting that dental coverage. 
not just like in the old days in the 70s and 80s, you know, we sit down, we do the free, we send the bill in and we're ready to go. It's not like that anymore. So, so you're a dentist and a lawyer. What percent of the dentists that sign these PPO contracts, what percent of the dentists do you think read the actual contract versus just accepting, like when you're on a website, they say to enter this website, you have to accept the terms and conditions. Like when I upgrade my iPhone, I mean, I'm gonna upgrade it. Apple wants me to accept this legal agreement. I mean, even if you read it and didn't like it, what are you going to do? You're going to give away your iPhone. So, what? What? So, my question is, what percent of the dentists do you think read the actual PPO contract they signed? And as a dentist and attorney, do you think they should read the PPO contract that they signed? Yeah. Um, first off, I, I have a law degree, but I don't practice law because I enjoy dentistry much more. Uh, it's just the way life took me. Um, so, with that question, uh, the PPO contract. Each one is different, and there's some major downfalls in most of them if you don't read it. And the biggest thing is that um, you is the favored most favored state clause, which means uh, one of them is that whatever your lowest fee is is what you have to bill the insurance company, not what's on the fee schedule anymore. And you, that's one part. And you, I doubt if any of the dentists out there actually read them. Uh, I think they look at the fee schedule. Hey, it's acceptable or not acceptable. And most like most dentists I know, they look at the how much a profi is, how much a crown is, and how much uh, something else is, and they make a decision on that. And then they're finding out later that it's not working out like they planned because of different clauses in that contract. So, so walk us through your book. You wrote Professional Responsibility in Dentistry, A Practical Guide to Law and Ethics. Um, it's on Amazon. Um, walk us through your journey. What made you... Um, it says, Professional Responsibility in Dentistry, A Practical Guide to Law and Ethics is a book that integrates dental law, risk management, professionalism and ethics as um, all are interrelated in everyday practice. What what made you, What tell us about what made you sit down to write a book, because that, that's no yeah. small undertaking to write a book. No, it took about six years, that book. Wow. Um, you know, you, you do that in between things. But why <laughs> I aimed at professional responsibility and kind of covered all the bases on this, is that when I was uh, when I'm still teaching, but when I'm teaching classes on risk management, and then I teach classes on risk uh, ethics, and I'll teach some practice management classes, they're they're so intertwined with each other that you can't just teach ethics or just teach professional ma uh, practice management or or you, you know risk management all by itself. You have to include all these other facets and concepts, um, and that's how that's all come about. Is because I when I teach, I teach at all at one time. In other words, a practicing dentist, once he's out, does not just think about an ethical solution to a problem. Just like my favorite kind of situation is scenario is a veneer, a patient who has six veneers. Um, you did them, she liked them, or he liked them, and comes back a month later saying they don't like them. And there's nothing wrong clinically, everything's acceptable and all that. They don't like the shade of it. It's a little too white or a little too dark. Well, you know, ethically, legally, do you have to do them? No, but, you know, practice management maybe says, you know what, maybe you might want to think we're doing it because that person has, you know, a very large family, very well known in your town, and maybe in your best interest, just redo them and take, you know, go from there. Um, you know, it's a practice management, it's a business decision, and you have to take all these other things in consideration. So what, uh, when you're teaching ethics, what, what are common ethical dilemmas that you've seen in your career? Uh, ones that the biggest ones that I've seen is the crossover to legal situations of billing the insurance wrongly. Um, it's unethical to up the code number when you're doing doing one thing and billing for another. That's ethical and legal. Uh, also, uh, not standing behind your your word. A lot of times, patient you know they say, "Oh, if any problem, let me know." And then the patient comes back and says, "Yeah, I'm having a little problem." Well, you have to pay for that to be done. And they're like, "Well, no, it's the same thing I just had done." six months ago. And so if you're going to stand behind what you do, as we should ethically, as a professional, um, be responsible for our treatment of our patients to a certain degree, um, to basically uh, stand behind that and honor it. So, you know, those are the biggest ethical things I find. Patients being disgruntled by the dentists who don't follow through. They don't answer their phone calls on emergencies. These are all things that cross over to legal, but that's what really gets people upset ethically. And and when you start dealing with like dentistry and law, 
What percent of it do you think is dealing with upset patients who are suing versus upset staff HR? Oh, okay, two different things there. Uh, the patient is usually upset because of poor communications within the office, and that's coming from the dentist down. Uh, a lot of times, dentists, some dentists like to step back and have an office manager take care of all the problems, and that usually does not fare well for the dentist because the office manager usually has a goals and business in mind rather than patient care. Um, whereas the dentist, when he's kept out of the picture on that, the patient gets very upset that they, I can't talk to the dentist. I want to talk to the dentist himself. Um, so you can't have a staff that protects the dentist too much, filters it too highly, the phone calls. And the other part is that you have to listen to what your patient, your uh, staff is saying to the patients. Um, you know, we all have goals. If you're a real business, you have some goals for the office. You have some things, you know, kind of get people working together. And if they are not astute to your philosophy of taking care of the patient first, they may, you know, misspoke, misspeak to a patient and therefore uh, cause a little problem. And then you have to step in as a dentist and correct it. And not everybody wants the confrontation. And I, I don't know, as you've, you've practiced 30 years, something, I've been, I'm on 39 right now, and you can't please everybody. And every once in a while you get a patient who, you know, gotta, you got to listen to them. And they just want to spot off to you. And I've had patients get mad at me over the years, not many, one or two or three, but you have to listen to it. And I have had them call me back and say, I'm really sorry. I just had a vent on somebody. I have other things, issues in my life. And it just happened. That was the one thing that got the patient upset due to some miscommunication within the office. So how can you be 10 years older than me and have more hair than I did in high school? <laughs> I don't know. I, I wore a helmet when I played football. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, here's a weird thing I always see with uh, dentists on dental town whenever they're talking about ethics and lawsuits, whatever. A patient will send a letter or an email or leave a message and their first response is they go on dental town and they say what was said and that they called their professional liability deal. And I, I don't know if it's because I'm from small town Kansas, but I think the reason I've avoided all the any lawsuit in dentistry is whenever a patient uh, complained or left a mess or whatever, I the first person I called was the patient. Yeah. I think it's so bizarre that these so many dentists on dental town first call their malpractice carrier. Is that weird to you too? Yeah. yeah. The thing is, is that if you've done something that you've really had a problem and when you go below the standard of care, most dentists know it. I mean, you know when you've messed up and something didn't go right or it was not just bad dentistry, a bad result that was beyond your control. Sometimes, yes, you should call your carrier. I have to do that lately. You know, hey, this is, you really went off the reservation. But other times, you know, hey, it's just an upset patient. Talk to the patient. See what the problem is. It can be easily diffused, diffused by, by just having the patient come in and redoing some work or referring to a specialist because it's something that, in an explanation, they misunderstood that it's something that's other than what you did. So a lot of times, a lot of miscommunication, and, and the only the dentist who treated the patient really should be the one talking to that patient. Um, the only time you should not call the patient is that you get a letter from an attorney. Once that happens, you got to call your carrier. Do not intercept that situation. Uh, that, I'll tell you that is one of the biggest problems because it can muddle up it really bad. Because right now, it's no longer just an angry patient. They've got a, a, an expensive attorney on the other end looking to get some payment. So uh, stay out of that kind of situation and call your carrier immediately on that. You, you just said something uh, rolled off your tongue. You said standard of care. It seems like most dentists, it seems like every definition you ever hear of standard of care is different. It seems like that's, there's not even a standard definition of standard yeah. of care. How would, you, how would you describe standard of care? Because you, you've... Uh, You've obviously yeah. had to think about it in California and New York, two very litigious states. Yeah, uh, that's true. Um, standard of care is basically what a reasonably prudent dentist. Say it again. A what? reasonably prudent dentist would do or would have done in a similar situation or circumstances that the, de the treating dentist did. So it does not, the actual standard of care definition does not say what the specialist did, does not say what the dental school did, does not say what your best buddy at your study club did. All of them are probably practicing within the standard of care. But standard of care is also much wider than just the technique. It's more than just technique protocols. Technique protocols are one thing. Um, standard of care is much wider in scope. Um, take an extraction, for example. In an extraction, you could have done a great extraction, no problems, everything else, 
But you know what? You didn't give post op instructions to call the office if, if anything's a problem. And the lady or man ends up going to the hospital because they're bleeding quite a bit because they didn't know they should have called the office first. All of a sudden, things go haywire. Standard of care says you got to give some post operative instructions plus a follow up, you know, phone number to be contacted if there's a problem or some kind of way to contact the, the, the treating dentist. So that means that standard of care was not met even though the, the actual treatment protocols were met, except for what happens afterwards. So standard care is much wider in scope. So, um, you know, 80% of dentists are general dentists and the other, or I, I don't know what percent, it's, it's yeah. less than 80, but 80-20. But um, does a general dentist have to do a root canal to the standard of an endodontist? Yes, uh, in, in a simple answer, yes. Um, though I'll tell you, since I've been practicing so long as you know, a very long time, uh, there was a time when anything beyond the apex would be called an overfill and would be malpractice. Uh, always uh, back in some schools, we always say you have to be a millimeter within the tooth, shy of the apex, to be okay. Other ones now look for that little puff at the end of a root canal to possibly, uh, you know, uh, seal the, the end of the apex. So there is a little range there of treatment protocols or whatever uh, as a say a successful root canal. Um, specialists, basically the standard of care, uh, some states still follow a community rule that what are the dentists doing around that community uh, rather than what they're doing nationally. But uh, many states are changing that uh, range or scope of uh, definition to include nationally because of the uh, internet, magazines, everything's pretty much available worldwide now. And so there's no reason why you cannot be up to date with uh, treatment protocols and the standard of care for whatever you're doing. It, does it seem, it seems disingenuous to me because you know, I'm, I'm a dentist and I have an MBA from Arizona State. Um, you take GM, they have five price points on a car. They have a low cost Chevy, a little more Pontiac, a little more Olds, a little more Buick, a little more Cadillac. In Arizona, the average general dentist is getting six to $800 for a molar root canal. And the average endodontist is getting 12 to 1500. Um, am I, how do I get paid for a Chevy and then be graded against a Cadillac? Does that even make sense to, does that make sense? It, I understand where you're coming from, but it's patient care that comes first. And if you can't do the root canal properly, you should not be doing it. And the, the price wise is something that's a contract driven. Uh, and the reason that you, we are as general dentists getting that lower numbers because there's so many of us. And so the insurance companies take advantage of us on that regard. I mean, I, there's no way around it. I mean, if you don't take any insurance, you could probably not, unless you're in a very well-to-do neighborhood that doesn't care about their insurance, uh, which are very few neighborhoods in the world, <laughs> in a country like that. Most, most of us have to take some PPO of some nature uh, to survive. So, you know, it's, you have to decide which ones you're willing to take the, the cut in, in fee. An endodontist once told me, he said, you know, the difference between endodontist and general dentist is they always find three canals in a maxillary first molar, and, and he says he always finds four. And I said, well, since you're paid twice as much, you should have found six. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I want to ask you another thing about uh, the change in insurance from when you and I got out of school to now. Um, you're starting to see, uh, I noticed the journal, the JOE, the Journal of Endodontics, uh, got a hold of a big database of insurance. And they were able to prove through insurance data of claims paid that a endodontist at five years had a 5% higher success rate than a general dentist. You know, you could measure by extraction, by retreats, et cetera. You know, if I was going to have a bypass done and they said you had a one in 20 better chance than the next guy, I mean, that means something yeah, to me. Yeah. Do, do, do you think the future is going to, um, with big data, that eventually insurance companies might say, you know, Howard, you have a 10% failure rate on molar endo, so we no longer are going to reimburse you for molar endo. And uh, Joseph Grasskemper has a 95% chance, so we're going to cover his endo, but not your. I mean, do you, do you see those changes down the road? Well, it's starting right now with one insurance company rating their dentist. Okay, one insurance company now rates the dentist online on their website, and they use superfluous things, they say that it's very well measured and everything else, but it's still superfluous. Um, you know, it's however, whoever's looking at can the you, data. Can you tell us the website? Uh, or would you I not? like to keep out of the insurance company. There's one doing it right now that- um, Email me when we're done. Let me- I'll, I can, I'll, I can I'll, give I'll... you the information per personally, <laughs> but I, I, it's, it's kind of I'm in, the, in the mess of it now. So, so you're, this is in New York? Yes, and California, they've done it. 
So, so, what, so what, what are they doing? Well, okay, on a rating from one to five, you get a rating of low is one, high is five. And they take into consideration several different things. Um, if I can call them all to mind, I don't know off the top of my head, but basically your web presence is partially rated. I mean, the things that don't even have to do with dentistry are being rated. Your fee schedule, you know, a, a low fee does not mean bad dentistry. A high fee does not mean good dentistry. Um, it's just they rate this as a superfluous way of get, guiding their patient, their, their patient load or their clients to dentists with the lowest fees. So they have less reimbursements and less payments. So, so, so you I, think that's their economic incentive to try to drive, dent, drive patients to lower fees? To lower fees and people who may not do as much dentistry kind of watch things more, you know, the, the less uh, treatment rendered. And I think they, those, those are very readily data, database items with insurance companies. Um, and so the, basically, they, you know, they, and they will someday, Howard. I'll tell you, I think someday they may say, you know what? General dentists are not going to be doing impacted wisdom teeth or something like that. Um, and they won't reimburse it. They you can do it, but they're not going to pay it, uh, pay on it. And even the dental schools have cut back on the amount of endodontics they do. Remember when we went to school, we had to do how many root canals? Now some some get out of dental school without doing any. Some dental schools don't. They they just don't have enough patients or not enough instructors. I don't know the cause of that, but many of them just don't. They they graduate without ha having done a root canal, and that's that's unbelievable. You've spent a lot of time in uh, dentistry and dental ethics. Do you think that the um, the high student loan debt of three hundred and fifty thousand dollars might make some dental graduates jaded in their diagnosing and treatment planning? You said that perfectly. I have I've currently I'm trying to put together a survey or a something through many different dental schools, but it's a uh, you have to go through IRB Internet uh, Independent uh, Research Boards, which makes it very difficult to say multi-site uh, review. I truly believe, if just like when you started your practice, I started my practice, it's enough to buy the practice, buy into a practice, costs hundreds of thousands. Now on top of that, add on that student debt, and you know what, you're gonna be looking at trying to sell dentistry, which I don't believe you should sell dentistry, you should sell trust in yourself, but that's a whole other discussion. But they are trying to sell dentistry so much that, um, you know, that's why these corporate dentistry operations have opened up and blossomed in that they can push production levels very high on some of these uh, young graduates. And the only way you do that is by selling the dentistry, getting patients. Even if patients want to come in for veneers, they're going to sell six veneers. It's, it, it is, a, it is a, a problem, I think, that oh, weights heavily on a new graduate of, in their diagnosing of the patient. And it's very hard not to have that weight because don't forget, they're at the age now, 20, some mid 20s, maybe early 30s, so babies, families, you know what it is. You, knew, you know, you got to get the, the sports car goes and the minivan pulls in, uh, that kind of thing. So, you know, things, more responsibilities financially. And all of a sudden, it starts to weight pretty heavily on these young young practitioners. Well, you know, the in the United States, the, um, the average dental student is about 350,000. Yeah. Like that. Uh, the, the, Dental practice transition uh, experts who sell the most dental offices say that the the most liquid dental office selling is about six fifty. Uh, the banks are giving them uh, signature loans after a year of graduation. So you routinely meet 25, 26, 27 year old kids who are a million dollars in debt just from their practice and student loans. One million dollars. Uh, I, at the recent uh, Congress of the International Dental Ethics and Law Society in Chicago a few weeks ago, um, I spoke at that. And the thing is, is that this debt, okay, the, the problem is that they don't care if dentists have a lot of collateral on signing. They're, they're happy to sign these, these big numbers over to a dentist in a practice or to buy a practice or set up a practice because dentists... 90 some percent of the time, a very high percentage, are probably the most bankable profession to be to be let, uh, given a loan. They pay, they pay. We pay. Dentists are honest. We're hardworking. We pay our debts. We we make it work, and uh, that's something to be very proud of uh, for dentistry overall. I think that uh, we. You know, Bank of America is the largest financer that I know of in dentistry, and they have a 99.5 percent yep. success rate. And the 0.5 that fail is usually a personal failure that lost their license, whether it be 
you know, something, substance abuse, alcohol, <laughs> so, some, something lost license. But, you know, it almost makes me wonder, you know, they say that history always repeats itself. Would you say the modern dental student is the return of the indentured servant from a couple hundred years ago where they had to give up seven years of their life to work a farm just for a free ticket from the old world to the new world? Yeah, it's that's it's becoming that with that high debt because, uh, but, you know, I, I, on the other side of the coin, let's look at it. When I bought into my practice, bought a partner, and then bought the partner out, I was high hundreds of thousands of dollars, close to, you know, closer to a million than let not. Let's put it that way. I paid it off. I paid them, you know, and yeah, I ate a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches first. I'm sure you did too when we started out. That's what it was. And uh, something that gets me is that when I have these oh, young dentists email me two, three years out of, out of dental school and out of their residencies, and they say, hey, I can't make it, da, 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 big problems, the contract problems, money problems, whatever. And they contact me, uh, former students of mine. And I say, well, okay, what kind of car are you driving? Oh, yeah, I just picked up a new BMW. Well, I mean, I drove a t Toyota Corolla for eight years until it died. You know, yeah, to I pick know. Up. And I so know. I have to put some responsibility for this whole problem on the students in that why are you going and buying a, a McMansion you know, and you drive the new BMW, but you, you can't pay your lab guy. And, you know, I've had my own lab. I, I know dentists do this. And it's like, hey, pay the lab guy first. Then if there's, you know, then go get the car. You know, it, that's I know. And, you know, the, what, and the, my first thought when they say, well, the average dentist graduated $350,000 student loan. So, yeah, because they had access to credit. I mean, if, if you gave every kid in America a credit card on their freshman day of high school, what percent yeah. of them would max it out at the mall that week? Oh, 100 percent of them. And, it's yeah, the same here. it's easy credit. And, and you know, I, I, I did not have a car in undergrad. I did not have a car till senior year. And now I'm finally a grandpa and my car is a 2004 and it's 2016. And my, my car is 12 years old and I see these kids that just graduated and they have a brand new BMW. Yeah, it's it's I don't know how they do it. I I, I really don't. Um, it's, they gotta take responsibility. And the thing is that I, I think I teach also with business management is, is, is good debt and bad debt. And I'm sure you're aware. There's good debt and bad debt. Uh, you know, a car, bad debt. Nordstrom credit, not to pick on Nordstrom's, but a, you know, credit card at, the, at Bloomingdale or something, bad debt. A debt for an office that's gonna return money on you, good debt. And they have to understand, you know, how that works because uh, you know that's an investment and one's not the BMW is not going to go up in value you may think it is you, you know who, you know who's the most successful dental graduates that I've noticed and for 30 years I mean it's just so obvious is all the foreign born dentists that came to the United States I mean it's like if they came from a poor country they worked all through dental school they get out of dental school they live in an apartment they get an apartment that's walking distance to their job. They don't have a car. They cook at home. I mean, I almost can say just I, I can I can guarantee you that just the fact that you were born in the United States, you're going to have more debt, eat out more restaurants, buy newer cars and be servicing debt for decade after decade after decade. But if you came from Asia or Africa or Latin America, you probably had a part time job an old yep. car, walk to work, they seem to get debt free faster than anyone. Well, their family, they were brought up with no debt. Their families worked, that's how the, 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 their society worked. Ours worked is that, hey, here's cheap money, pay it back later when you got the money. You know, uh, the dollars will be worth less later, so pay, pay with, you know, cheaper dollars later. Uh, that whole philosophy, and plus there's that whole thing of, well, gee, you guys are driving around new cars, I wanna drive a new car, and a little bit of an entitlement of, well, you know what? It, well, it took 20 years to become an overnight success, as you know. It, the guy down the street who took, you know, all, fine, all of a sudden bought a nice house. Well, he's been doing it for 35 years, and all of a sudden he said, you know what? I'm I, now I, I paid off my debt. And now I, it's now it's for me, and it takes that long, 20 years to to pay it off. I mean, it just doesn't happen, and I think a lot of them don't have that sense of work ethic to wait that long for rewards. Back to uh, back to ethics. Um, some dentists think the boogeyman of the day is corporate dentistry. Do you see it that way or not really? N nah, not really, but there is a problem there. Um, you have to understand in the corporate dentistry, uh, any one of the big corporate uh, operations 
have three or four non-dentist owners or on the stock market even or something like that where they're, that person who's not producing other than management uh, services is making a good sum of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, which is they have to take a slice out of every filling, every root canal, every extraction, a slice of that has to go to maintain and support that big administrative staff, including the CEO. And so it goes on the backs of these young dentists that go to the corporate dentistry to produce so they can support the upper, upper echelon. Um, one of the bad things is that it's going to create a, a split in dentistry in that you will have your niche boutique dental office and your corporate dental office. Thereby, uh, people will gravitate to either one. Now, it doesn't mean one does not take insurance or one does only. It, it, uh, you can be a boutique dentist, dental office and still take all the PPOs and everything. It's, it's how you're treating that patient differently. Um, in the corporate dentistry, most of those dentists leave in about two years, one to two years they usually leave. They get their experience, they get some money in their pocket, start paying it, they don't spend it stupidly. Um, and they leave and they go set their own or go try to get into a pri more private practice. So the turnover of dentists really, um, unless the patient doesn't mind that kind of a thing of no follow through by a, a, a certain one person, uh, that's gonna affect, that's one of their biggest problems is the turnover of their dentist because who's the dentist of the day today? They come in every time, one guy preps the tooth, one girl uh, cements it. it it, 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 there's the, the disconnect there, and I think that's one of the problems with the corporate dentistry. You know, a lot of people always talk about the Walgreens analogy, saying that when you and I were little, every pharmacist owned their own store. But, yep. you know, going, you know, if I needed 28 tabs of penicillin, I'd just soon go to an ATM machine. I wish, I wish the prescription was on a plastic debit card and just get, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't need to talk to the pharmacist. But it seems like dentistry is all hands-on surgery, and it seems like Americans are extremely finicky on who touches them, leans them back in the chair, works in their mouth, gives them a shot that doesn't hurt. Yeah, well that's what it's all about is building that trust of that patient. In corporate dentistry, that young dentist, even though they may think they're building a trustful relationship, when they leave that corporate office, that patient's not following them, more times than not. Very rare. And why, why do you think that is? Oh, there's not, well, you know, the non-competes, the radius of non-competing is very big around these uh, corporate practices. Um, the second thing is that that young dentist is just thrown in to produce um, and very little, uh, they give some support, but when you're with a in, one individual, say a young dentist comes in and works with me as an associate, I basically would uh, you know, take him under my arm and show him how to talk to a patient and how to gain that trust and how to take interest in the patient as a person, not just a mouthful of teeth. So, you know, um, when you look at all the data on podcasting, it's a young person sport. It's, they're under 30. Um, almost no one podcasts at our age, and almost every email I get to this show, Howard at Dentaltown.com, they're under 30. So put on your dad hat and talk to this 25 year old girl that just graduated two months ago. How does she build trust with her patients? Well, first off, you have to connect with them, and to connect with them, you have to understand where they're coming from. Not everybody walks in with a thousand dollars in their back pocket to buy a crown. Some people have to, hey, can I make three payments or something like that? It's a financial thing of understanding where that patient is in their life. Um, it's also understanding the patient, who are they? Do they have a family? Are they married? Are they, they have kids? Uh, connect with them. Try to find something that you say, oh, yeah, I've got two kids. Oh, really? What age are yours? Oh, and you start talking. It only takes a couple of minutes if that. You don't sit there and talk about the whole lifetime of, of experiences. But you do connect with that patient somehow. Uh, you know, a guy plays sports, some girls play sports, you know, you play sports. I, I connect with people all the time in sports. There's all so many different topics you can touch on that, you know, you have to, you know, to, to connect with that patient. And it's that connection that they feel trust, they feel safe, they feel like you care. And they, basically that's what it is. They, they, you get a one-on-one -on -one experience with that patient. And the best thing to do is try to connect with that patient somehow. Um, some patients don't want to be connected with, it may take a little more time. May take a couple of visits. Always let them know that you're there. I have patients that came to my house. I live very close to my practice, and then I've had people come to my office, my, my house, on a Saturday afternoon. Hey, I broke my denture. And I got a dent, a wedding to go to, and it's like, okay, hey, I'll meet you in the office in ten minutes. You know that kind of thing. You got to be available, and you got to be there for them when they need you. Okay, that same that same girl. She just graduated two months ago. She's got three hundred fifty thousand dollars of debt, and she's saying, Doctor Grasskeeper. Um, 
do I need to buy a CBCT, a CAD CAM, a laser, oh. learn how to place Invisalign, sleep apnea, and place implants yeah. to be a successful dentist? Because okay. okay, first off, somebody just getting out of school, I don't think they have enough business sense unless they have someone in there that can teach them a little bit. But I don't think anybody just right out of dental school has enough business sense to open an office these days. It takes a, a heck of a lot of experience and knowledge to business-wise to make Peter pay Paul all the time on time. Uh, first thing to do is get your just basic instru instrumentarium. You know, and a good nice X-ray, a digital X-ray is fine. You don't have to get 50 of them. You don't need to get uh, that CBTCT. You do not need all that right away. Um, you know, because you know a CAD CAM, you know, a CEREC machine, nothing against CEREC or uh, ED4. I'm not picking on any company, but you don't need all that the first day you open. Um, when I started in California, I bought a practice that was bought it, worked in it, bought into it as a partner, and then bought out the partner. And we were, you know, once I bought out the partner, I turned it into a multi-specialty practice. And we were, we got, at that time, we bought all the buzzes and bells and everything else because we had the finances to do it. When I moved to California, or to New York from California, I started with a two chair and we had to step over one chair at the foot area. You had to step over that chair to get to the second chair. And I had one extra unit, yeah, one extra <laughs> unit that swung between the wall to one uh, the other room because that's all I could afford. I had $125,000 from the bank, and that's all I was going to spend. And that's what I did. And I set up very small. It got so much, I finally got a hygienist there a little bit. I was working on one off. It got to be where I had to expand, and now I bought my own building next door. And, you know, it got four chairs, lots of room, plenty of, you know, area. And I still don't have a, a CEREC or ED4 or a CBCT. I don't have any of that. Um, I, I, at my age, I, the investment wise wouldn't pay off, of course. But even then, um, if I if I was placing implants, maybe I would think something like that. But really, I don't have the need for that right now in way how I practice. Um, you know, uh, one of these, these machines are a hundred and some thousand dollars each, you know, and to put that kind of money into it at, at when you're 60 some years old, uh, doesn't pay off. Uh, whereas, you know, if you're 30 years old and you finally got all that basic stuff paid for, then consider it because so, you don't want that pressure on you. So, so again, kids, listen to this. Here's an extremely successful dentist. He does not have a CBCT. He does not have a CAD cam. Do you have a laser? No. no I, I mean, I mean, when, if you, if I lined up 100 dentists who are just crushing it, they don't do sleep apnea. They don't place implants. They don't do Invisalign. They don't have a, they don't do any of the, there, there's all this noise making all these kids feel like they got to double their student loan debt in 30 days so that somebody on wall street can double their money. And the bottom line is it comes down to like a football game is won by a tackle, a pass. Someone caught the pass. Someone made a block. I mean, if you right. can't block tackle pass or receive it, yeah, yeah, you're not, you know, you're not going to learn some flea flicker play. And that's what dentistry is. Nail a shot, a cleaning, a crown, a filling. Just, and I want to ask you another question. You used to own a lab. Yes. And now there's a lot of people about, I think about 12 to 14% of the dentists now have bought into the, the CAD CAM. And, and when you and I graduated from school, there were 15,000 labs in the United States. Now right. there's half that number. There's 7,500. And they're dying rapidly. What what do you think of the whole digital CAD CAM revolution? What do you think of the fact that half the labs are gone now? What, yeah. uh, um, well, I have no problem with CAD CAM and all that all that kind of stuff. It, the problem is that it's highly technique sensitive. Um, I have taken quite a few of them out because the, the everybody relies on the cement to hold on, and then it washes out and breaks down, and there's gaps and everything else. Um, not all of them. I'm just saying that's been my experience with many of them when I, they come to my office. And I replace them with a good old-fashioned PFM with no problem. Uh, I just feel like, you know, once you have a machine that does that, you, are, you pressure yourself to get it paid for. And you have to do so many of those a month to make sure that piece of equipment is uh, financially uh, paid for. And I think that's unless you can go buy it or have that area in your practice that it can, you can dedicate that to, um, I think that would be, you know, be careful with, you know, doing stuff that you, you puts you in a bind financially. You and I both agree that probably at least 80% of the dentists have never read any of their uh, PPO contracts they've signed. No. I mean, you and I both agree with that. The, what percent of dentists do you think have an HR manual for their labor 
And again, you come from the most lawsuit crazy states are California and New York. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in Kansas where everything was done on a handshake. Um, what percent of dentists do you think have an HR manual? And do you think that's, as a dentist and a lawyer, do you think that's dentally, a, a business necessary to have I an just, HR manual? Yeah. I, I basically talking about an office policy manual. And I just gave a talk uh, last year, American College of Legal Dentists. We have an annual uh, aspects of dental law and ethics, and it's in Vegas this year. I'll just put a plug in. If it's Vegas this year, at the end of February, aclm.org, you can look it up. Uh, yeah. But anyway, the thing is, is that the office policy manual is truly a legal document that you must have in your office. It's to keep both the players, the employer and the employee, on even ground when talking, when problems occur. And believe me, you, as you know, you've been in practice long enough, problems occur from you don't even know where they came from. Uh, you know, people are people and they tend to do things that you just don't expect. So you have to have an office policy manual. That way everybody knows how much vacation, what's the sick pay, how uh, sick days off, uh, you know, how am I getting paid? How many hours am I expected to work? What are my job duties? I mean, it just goes on and on. And each state's a little different in what has to be in there. Um, and I, I think it's mandatory that uh, if you don't have one, ADA and AGD both have uh, things you can guidelines you can go by. And the ADA has a um, a free service that if you send the PPO contract, their lawyers <laughs> review it for free. Yeah, that that um that aclm.org American College of Legal Medicine um, is that what percent of that is MD versus a uh, dentist? Okay, majority are all dual degreed. Um, about 80 90 percent are MD JDs. But our DDS JD uh, membership is growing rapidly. Um, there's just more of them. That's all, and that's understandable. Um, but we have a very strong uh, presence at the every every year we have a conference, and uh, we have a very strong presence with great speakers. And I'll tell you, the, the just for example, when that bleaching thing came up in uh, the Carolinas, and we went all the way through the Supreme Court. Did talk, turn, talk about that case. A little yeah. more detail in case then these kids miss that. Yeah, um, several years back, I think it was about three years ago. South Carolina, I believe it was South Carolina, uh, the board of directors or the state board of dentistry uh, wanted the bleaching to be stopped in beauty salons, malls, and things like that. You know what I'm talking about. So the state uh, dental board went before the state, their state courts and pleaded to shut them down that they're practicing dentistry without a license. Well, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says, too bad, that's a uh, you know restriction of trade, and you we are going to be allowed to do that. They're still going to be allowed to do that, and the reason being is that all the members of the state board were all dentists, and they were they were the, like the final say. There's no oversight over them, so they were basically holding in or stopping any competition, and that's a restriction of trade. And that's when uh, the Supreme Court and uh, the FTC and many other people do not like. Uh, so basically, they shot that down and what has to happen is that the state boards in most states have to reorganize themselves to either be over have some oversight from a department of education or department of consumer affairs depending on what state you're in or have some um you know non-dentists on the state board which you know how much you know how's that work when somebody's uh, making up dental rules and regulations and are not even a dentist i don't know it's, it's a very compounded uh situation so, you know, uh, we'll see what happens. So that's a, another uh, one that's uh, interesting is now Invisalign um, has partnered with a company, it looks like, um, to do uh, clear aligners uh, bypassing the orthodontist. Kind of yep. like this is was bleaching in a mall without a dentist. It looks like orthodontics with clear aligners is going to, is now available in the United States without an orthodontist involved. What are you following this? I I, I haven't followed. It. I heard of it. Um, it hasn't come across my desk yet. I usually get things I, when it's already a bigger problem. I guess uh, I have heard of it, and it's uh, again corporate uh, dentistry in a different man. You know, from the manufacturer point of view, uh, looking at an inroad into uh, profits, and you know, it's very simple.
Yeah, it's called, um, there's two companies doing it. It's called Smile Care Club and Crystal Braces. And basically, you call them up and they send you an, um, an impression putty technique. And you, you mix the impression and bite into it and mail it back. And then these uh, Invisalign companies will uh, scan it and make their clear uh, retainer yeah. as if a dental office sent it in. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who's 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 uh, swiping the teeth, you know, stripping the teeth in between to make things fit together. I don't know who's doing that. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, limited limited use. Yeah, best. that is amazing. I want to ask you another thing. Um, we just had six thousand dental uh, students graduate uh, two months ago. This is October August 29th. Yeah. They just walked out of school two months ago. Um, I want to talk about a whole different legal deal. So she's she's going back to Salina, Kansas. And uh, she wants a job, and there's three dentists that are looking for an associate. A lot of times, you know, they don't know, well, well, who do I go with? I mean, this guy's paying 25%, but I pay my lab bill. This guy's paying 30%, but I pay. I mean, should it be on, what are things you would look for uh, for this young kid? If she's got three different dentists to work for, she's straight out of school, what should she be thinking about on who she should work for? Okay, the biggest three things that they need to look for is how wide an area of non-compete. So if you're working there only one day a week and they say 10 miles distance or something for a reasonable amount of time of five years in the contract, well, now wait a minute, let's think about the influence that associate is going to have on that practice. At one day a week, it's minimal. They should not be having a large area of non-compete for a long period of time. It's different if the associate's working full time five days a week in the practice. That's a big influence. And yes, now you need a more secure non compete. And the other thing you got to look at is how you're going to get paid and keep track of how you're getting paid. Don't rely on the owner's computer to always be right. Um, I, when I was in California, we were, we were computerized in 1985, was the, when I bought, got my first computer. 84, 84, 85. And it was back then a little mini computer in a special area and everything else. And with all the specialists, hey, someone can put it in the wrong column and under the wrong dentist who gets paid wrong. You got to keep track of yourself. You have to keep records and get your day sheet daily and, and understand who's paying who and and why. Um, you got to watch your production and collection. You really do. And I you always tell them, keep your own records because don't just rely on that because mistakes happen innocently or sometimes on purpose. I've had one periodontist who worked for a, a dentist, um, a general, a, a, another periodontist, for nine months without a contract, which is completely crazy. Um, I give you three months to find if you like each other, and that, if you ever get a contract, something, something down on paper. But he did not, and he ended up uh, the dentist ended up owing him sixty thousand dollars that he hasn't been paid for, but he's still working there, wondering what do I do? I, if I leave, he'll never pay me. So it, you get in these binds of not following up on what you're supposed to get paid. And that's, that's a shame, but that's what happens. Um, a lot of times when they go get a job, they might land on the job because there's, um, say there's three dentists and two of them just want a straight up associate. But one of them uh, says, well, you know, I'm 60 years old and my goal is to retire at 65. And why don't you come work for me? And, and then uh, maybe after a couple of years, everything works out. Well, you know, we'll just be dating now. And. Maybe after a couple of years, uh, if this is your fit, uh, and then I'll start to uh, sell to you. Uh, what what legal loopholes are uh, should she be thinking walking into that relationship? It, okay, if that's the case, definitely in your associate's contract, have a letter of intent to sell, the right of first refusal, which basically tells the practice man, practice owner that you have to, you know you have to be sold to or be offered that practice first. Or, you know, if he's very, he or she is very honest about, hey, I really do want to get out of here in two years, let's pick up a, a, a buy and sell agreement now on the purchase of the practice because that new associate is going to probably double that practice or at least add 40, 50% to it. And all they do is end up buying back what they built. Absolutely. So the thing is, you know, ding, 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 like, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> yeah. You know, and all of a sudden, that's what, that's what happened to me. I, I, I bought into practice for X amount. And it was after a year and a, two years of working there, which I doubled. I, I, I doubled the practice in that time. Right. He did, I, I doubled it. And now I'm buying back half that practice from what I paid for. And I was like, what am I doing this for? I couldn't. But it was good practice. It was good. You know, it's just a nice fit. I, it was like a brother to me at that time. And, uh, you know, it just that's what I did. I learned a lot.
hard way. So you know, it's a uh, you know the the funniest thing I I love when I uh, lecture around the rest of the world is how many people say, "Oh yeah, I've been in the United States," and I say, "Really? Where'd you go?" And they always say the same thing. I went to the Greater New York meeting, and and uh, oh. I said, "Well, did you ever leave Manhattan?" And they no. And I just think, man, if you if you saw Manhattan and you think that's America, I yeah. mean, America is yeah. a big country. So so how does this little girl? She's 25. How does she pick up? a buy-sell agreement. I mean, she might be in Wyoming. She might be in Texas, oh, Idaho. Yeah. No, no, no. It, it can be done anywhere. This is just a simple understanding. But and where, it doesn't, where, where, where would she find it, though? How should she look to find a buy-sell? She's going to have to find uh, when, first off, whenever there's a associate, they should have an associate's co working contract. To, just the, that working situation should be on under, 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 uh, paper, on our contract. It, with that should also be another either a letter of intent to sell, which means you would have the right of first refusal to buy, or a buy and sell agreement that's brought up by her attorney. She needs an attorney on this situation, and a practice management person, or somebody to advise her um, to go in and just do this on your own and say, I trust the guy I'm, I'm working with, it doesn't work out. 90 some percent of the time, I'll tell you, there's, they're ready to shoot each other after a few years. They, they you have to go in there with the open eyes, and if, you know, like when I started, I, I back, well, it was back in the 70s. I mean, that's a whole different world. But, you know, he said, oh, in one year, if you do what I do, you can buy in. Well, within one year, I was doing more than he was doing, and he still wouldn't do it, buy in. And so finally I said, I'm leaving, and that's when I got his attention. And I actually looked at other places to go, which I probably should have, but, uh, you know, we ended up being, okay, let's buy this practice now. And, you know, that's, you got to make sure you're going in uh, with some knowledge that, hey, if I, you want to really sell me the practice after two years or something, let's get a letter that says my the letter of intent, which is a contract if brought, properly drafted. Okay, so the the um, dentists in America have the same divorce rate as the general public. Uh, they have the same substance abuse. About 14% of America ends up, you know, in the Betty Ford Center or something. So they have the same divorce rate. So my question to you is a married man and a dentist. Um, when they get married and they become a partner, should should when they get married, should they have a prenuptial? And if I get it, and if I get a uh, a job, and I'm we're going to work for you two years, then we're going to get married, and me and Dr. Grasskemp are going to own 50-50, Well, that's going to have a divorce, a chance of divorce too. Um, how how do you so so should she have a prenuptial if she's going to marry Joe? And should she um and what should she be thinking about? Uh, going into a marriage with another dentist, 50-50. Okay. Um, marriage is different than a business. It's, it's based on different reasons why you get together. You don't marry somebody for business reasons. You marry somebody because you love them and you're going to go through life together. Uh, and having a prenuptial, as far as I'm concerned, personal belief this is, um, is a map of, hey, this is how we're going to split this this whole thing up when we when, when not if when uh, when we get divorced a prenuptial makes it easy to split things up um, it makes it easy when times are tough I've been married 30 some years and it, you know if I had a prenuptial I'm sure my wife would say hey, you're out of here you know <laughs> I'm, just I'm just kidding I hope she's not watching <laughs> uh, and the thing is is that a prenuptial with a marriage is one thing business you're going to partnership with a business I mean, this is this is basic business 101. You know that you know this. You got to have something. To, hey, how are we going to do this so that we don't kill each other? And that's why you have a contract that doesn't say how you're going to put it together. It also tells you how you're going to take it apart. That's a good contract, and that that other part has to be in there. How hey, if one dies, if one leaves, if one wants to sell, how's the sale of that going to be? If you can sell to somebody else, or it has to be sold to the partner. Uh, you need life insurance on you know, partner life insurance on each other. So if something does uh, the early demise of one, you have the money to, to you know pay off the family uh, for that half the practice or whatever portion they are agreed to. Uh, so those are all things that need to be taken care of by you know legal counsel, practice management people, people who know what they're doing. Um, I only got you for three more minutes. Um a lot of these kids right now are going off into the military, and you started out in the military. Talk about, uh, you had a Navy dental scholarship. You were stationed at Camp Pendleton with the 1st Fleet Marine Division as a Lieutenant U.S. Navy Dental Officer. What would you say to these young kids listening to you right now who are going off to the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, all that stuff? Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you, 
they a lot of times I, I push it a little hard with the students at Stony Brook because I think it's a great opportunity. It does get you to places that um, dentistry wise that you wouldn't ordinarily go because uh, you don't have somebody over you. Uh, in the, in the military, there's usually somebody uh, an endodontist around, a, a specialist around that you can go to and ask questions of. Many corporate type situations, or even if you're in a small office with one other one of the owner, uh, you know he's not so, or he or she may not be so proficient in extractions anymore. It does not want to do root canals anymore, and you really don't have anywhere to turn to. Uh, that's one thing. Secondly, is that um, if you're going to stay in for quite a while, they do you know promote you going to a specialty school if you want to. Uh, they do promote that by paying for that. Of course, you owe more years back, but they do promote that. Uh, the pay is not at great, but you know what? I most of the several of the specialists I hired in San Diego were retired military. Now they worked when they they went in when they were 26, 27, 28. They worked for 20 years, and then they got out when they're 40 something. Many of them start their own practices again. I started my practice here when I was 42 in Bellport. So you know you, you know so you have a, a pension plus you have a whole another career going. Many of them go into education after a uh, career in the uh, military. I only spent two years there. They, I just paid back my scholarship money, uh, time. And now, so, was that, is that the place right by Coronado Island? No, that's that's 32nd Street. That's Coronado. And it was 32nd. I was at um, Camp Pendleton with the Marines. Well, and where, where's Pendleton from Coronado, that hotel Coronado? Oh, oh, that's beautiful. Um, that's uh, northern San Diego. It separates north San Diego County from Orange County, L.A., Orange County area. In between there is Camp Pendleton, which is a Marine base. It's, camp, it's like Camp Lejeune on the East Coast. They have Camp Pendleton on the West Coast. Very, very large. Many different minor bases within there. I, I still think that Hotel Coronado Island. What is it? Hotel Coronado? Yeah, Hotel Coronado. I, I still, that's still my favorite hotel in the world. Oh, it's gorgeous there. You stay, ever stay in the old part? Yes, absolutely. And it's kid-friendly, so I could always take my four boys there when they were little. But it was so cool because you'd be sitting there on the beach watching the Marines do drills across yeah, the bay. Exactly. And you would just look at that stuff. And I mean, it was just, it was like a movie. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's a great place, uh, you know. And if you're lucky, you may see a few ghosts up on the second floor, third floor. A few what? Park. Some ghosts. There's ghosts Some, in that building. They, oh, is they, it haunted? Yeah, yeah, they say it is. So my last question is, uh, how can you have an ethics convention, the ACLM.org in Las Vegas? Isn't that kind of uh, mutually exclusive to have an ethics convention in Las Vegas? Isn't that Sin City? <laughs> well, I have no control of what people do after the convention, but, but uh, con uh, conference. But no, it, uh, it's a good place because it's easy to get to. That's one of the reasons we have it there every third year. Um, every three years it's there. Other times, uh, next uh, 2018 will be in Charleston. And then after that, um, we're looking at something on the West Coast, possibly L.A., uh, places that are easy to get to for everybody. Um, because if you, you hold it kind of a hard to get to, uh, not near an airport, it's it's a tough one. And last, uh, the last minute, yep. tell them uh, they can get your book, Professional Responsibility in Dentistry, A Practical Guide to Law and Ethics on Amazon.com by Joseph Grass Kemper, that's grass with just one G, not two. Kemper, K-E-M-P-E-R. What are they going to find in that book? What What is that book going to talk about? Well, there's a, there's a, the, it basically talks about law things, and then it covers a little bit of ethics, not much. And there's a whole part about new dentist issues. And it takes it from uh, the, la the third section of it, covers from associate contracts, defining a practice, financing a practice, pra uh, Everything from the start of that situation of becoming an associate to actually going on, and there's one chapter on how to set up a multi-specialty practice, how to do it. Very short, just the outline. This is a guide. Um, if you get too definitive in these kind of discussions, um, you know, no one puts their own creator, creative soul into it. You have to, you know, every office is a little different, and that's up to the owner. So it has all that information there, advertising, ethical advertising, how to do it. Um, I was one of the first dentists in the country to advertise in San Diego. We had the FTC to help us out, and uh, I'm sorry, we even had we had a lot, quite a bit. But it's not like the ads today. It, it was much better, uh, higher quality. I have to say it myself. And what I would say is uh, to you kids is all leaders are readers and they're street smart. And you know you can learn so much by buying a book on Amazon. You can learn so much about implants by buying Carl Mish's textbook. Yeah, I see so many of those kids. 
They can't learn anything unless they get on an airplane, fly clear across the country, stay in a resort for four days, drop four grand, and learn three pages of notes. Be street smart. I mean, these podcasts are free. Um, th- his book, read a book, uh, textbooks, uh, dentaltown.com, the, the online CE on dentaltown.com costs less money than the cab it's going to cost you from the airport to your hotel to take these uh, these uh, courses around the United States. Uh, just take an online course at Dentaltown for the price of cab fare. And if you want to learn uh, something smart, uh, read Joseph's book. Joseph, it is a complete honor that you decided to spend an hour with me and my homies today. Thank you uh, so much for uh, uh, accepting my invitation to be on my show. Well, on your birthday, no less. I must say, <laughs> I'm honored to have you do take you know your birthday and spend it with me. Well, that was. I hope, you, I hope you have a big birthday cake waiting for you. I do. My four boys, uh, they're all here. It's uh, it's all gonna right. be a fun day. But uh, seriously, thank you for all that you've done for dentistry. Thank you for writing that book. Thank you for teaching at dental school. Just thank you for an amazing career and sharing so much with so many of other dentists. Thank you, Howard. All Thank right. you. Have a great day.